Hi, my name is John Yunker, and today I want to focus on the global evolution of Nike.com. I am the co-founder of Bite Level Research. We were founded in 2000 specifically to look at the global evolution and best practices of websites, content, applications. Since 2003, I've produced the Web Globalization Report Card, which focuses on best practices in global websites, and I benchmark 150 global websites. And over these many years, I've consulted with quite a few companies, large and small, to help them improve their global reach. And finally, I'm author of the book, Think Outside the Country. So why Nike? Why did I choose Nike? Well, obviously, Nike is one of the world's most recognized brands. And yet, it is noticeably absent from this list, the top 25 best global websites. And this is from the most recent report card. It didn't make the cut. In fact, Nike is ranked number 52 out of the 150 global websites. So why is that? Well, in this brief presentation, I hope to explain a little bit of why that is, as well as as take a look at some of the larger uh, changes of the website and why they're significant, both pro and con. First, let's look at global reach, which is languages. Back in 2003, Nike supported a dozen languages and over the years has steadily increased its global reach to this year at 27 languages. Now, 27 is a significant number of languages and reflects a significant investment. However, if you look at Nike compared to other major global consumer brands, it lags. So we have 27 languages for Nike. Adidas is ahead at 30. Let's look at Apple at 35. And I would say these three companies are still punching below their weight in terms of global reach. They, I believe they should do a lot more. Zara is at 41 and Ikea at 44. So just looking at these consumer brands, Nike definitely has room to grow. And, we, and if we look at the report card, which benchmarks 150 global websites across a number of industry sectors, the average number of languages, languages supported is 33. And that is a significant number. Now, keep in mind, this reflects large companies. If I were to randomly sample 1,000 small to medium-sized companies, that average would drop to, to 10, if I'm generous. So it's a lot of languages. So, so why are languages so important? Well, this pie chart represents the roughly 4.5 billion internet users and their native languages. And as you can see here, the largest slice is Chinese, followed by English at 16%. And the slices get smaller and smaller and smaller until we end up with this really large slice, all other, all other languages. And it's just that way because the slices get so small, like they don't display well on, uh, on this pie. But the point here is that there's a lot of languages you need to support. If you want to support 90% plus of all internet users, you're going to have to support 40 to 50 plus languages. And that's in, that is why the report card uh, sets 50 languages as a requirement to receive a perfect score in the global reach category. Languages are, are critical uh, to being a global website. Uh, inter the internet might connect computers and devices, but language connects people. Now, sports are global. So one would think the globalization of a sports website should be relatively trivial, right? Uh, for example, we have this global sport known as football. And yet, if you look at it closely around the world, the spelling of the sport changes. Uh, and in fact, in the U.S., uh, it looks quite different. It's not even football. It's soccer because there's another football in the U.S. So it isn't quite so simple. Sports, uh, even this global sport, goes by different names, different spellings. Uh, and requiring different investments and localization in each market you focus on. So nothing is simple when it comes to web globalization, even if the product itself is global. In 2000 and 2012, in this time period, this is how Nike greeted visitors from around the world. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but I remember this page still. Uh, it was a splash landing page, and you selected your language, and then it, you, you had a choice of of countries and regions to select after you made that language selection. I found it a bit clunky to use because it was a multi-part uh, menu, uh, but it was Nike's first foray into that type of a scheme. 
And around this time period, Nike was not globally consistent. Uh, we have different, slightly di different designs around the world. Here we have on the left, Russia, on the right, Thailand. Uh, there was no real global template in use. And in fact, Nike was siloed around sports. And I think at the time they were focused uh, on developing web properties around each sport, like Nike Basketball, which had its own global gateway, and Nike Women, which was a dedicated website as well, which also had its own global gateway. So you can imagine the challenge of managing all these properties from a global perspective. And also imagine the experience of a user who might go to Nike.com and then to Nike Women and Nike Basketball, and each time have to re-navigate through. So not only is it difficult from the from Nike's perspective in terms of management, it's it's grossly inefficient, but from the user's expect experience, it's not ideal. It is actually quite cumbersome. So in 2014 really was the first year that Nike really started to coalesce around a global template. And that was a huge step forward. And uh, it's a step that many companies have to take. And not all of them have taken it yet, uh, but most global companies realize this is where they have to head because a global template allows you to be globally consistent, but locally flexible. In 2016, Nike debuted a different global gateway menu, and it wasn't ideal. It was also a splash page, and on the left here was what the mobile user sees. Um, but it was it was a change, and and that's all I can say. Uh, but the the design itself was the template itself uh, is similar to the template we see today. So this is when um, Nike got onto its its current template. Uh, we also see a use of flags in the header. Uh, something that is not ideal. And in fact, uh, three years later, the global gateway stays the same, still using flags. I do not recommend using flags for global navigation purposes. They don't scale well. There's geopolitical issues. And there's limitations on, on areas that don't have flags, like a regional website, like in this case, rest of Middle East. There is no flag for rest of Middle East. So there are flaws with the flag approach. And I highly recommend uh, uh, organizations migrate away from them. I also posted a presentation about Apple recently that you can view on YouTube that also talks about their uh, moving away from flags. Now, Nike has invested heavily in China. Of all of its markets outside of the U.S., I'd say China gets the, uh, the most attention these days uh, in terms of localization, depth of localization, also, uh, promotional efforts uh, like Singles Day, which is November 11th, which is the the most lucrative online shopping holiday in the world, and it's it's in China, and it is November 11th. It's extremely popular, and many Western brands now uh, do their best to capitalize on this as well. In the Middle East, Nike has not done so well. Uh, years ago, Nike did support a, a small degree of Arabic content and some degree of localization investment. But I pulled two home pages from today, and this is there are two country home pages here, Saudi Arabia and Israel. And you would be hard pressed to tell one from the other, or think, you know, or or be any clear as to what market they are relative to at all. They're both in English. There's no indication what market they're localized for. So Nike has definitely uh, not done well in this region. It's an underserved region linguistically and from a localization perspective. Last year, Nike made a subtle change that I picked up on, which was they dropped flags. And that's a wonderful thing. This was a huge step forward. As you can see here, the global gateway menu is now just one static page, no flags. This was a positive step for Nike, and I was pleased to, to see the company do that. Unfortunately, this year, something's missing now. Uh, there's no locale name in the header anymore. And on this uh, screen here, I actually videotaped or recorded what it would be like if you're, if you're a, a web user in France and you go to Nike and you want to change your locale. Scrolling, 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 and scrolling. And here we are at the bottom. That's what you've got to click to, to get out of this locale. And why is that important? Um, you, would, you might think, well, that's, that's an edge case. It's not that common. Well, 
Nike is using auto redirection here. So let's say the user genuine is multilingual, for example, and they want to go to the .com site, they're going to have to navigate manually to that site. So Nike's not making it easy to do so. So how does Nike get into the top 25 list? If I were to make three recommendations, they would be as follows. Well, for, for starters, invest in languages. Nike is a global brand, and yet it's not supporting very many languages, which is not ideal. It is not in the best interest of Nike's consumer base, and it is not, um, it's frankly not respectful of the world. Depth of localization is highly uneven. You know, there are some markets that, that receive a great deal of attention, other markets that are, that are just under supported. And then finally, global navigation. You have to prioritize global navigation and then keep it a priority. And I know I'm highlighting Nike here, but I could do a case study about a dozen or more websites that have seen their global navigation ebb and flow. It happens a lot. It happens a lot because oftentimes in, in global organizations, when a redesign happens, there is not an advocate for the global local user. There's not someone looking, look, looking specifically at the global navigation experience. And because that's the case, the global gateway usually gets demoted or sometimes removed entirely in worst cases. Um, so it's important for organizations to always be uh, including their localization team, their vendors into, in this process and their offices around the world who represent their customers, they need to be highly involved at early stages in these redesigns. So with that, I, I hope you found this presentation interesting, and I encourage you to check out the report card, which is a paid report. However, I often I offer a blog at globalbydesign.com that is free, and check me out at Twitter, John Yunker, and feel free to reach out with any questions, and if there are websites you'd like to see me profile in the future, please let me know. Thank you.